Hey, Gary Hoover here. You know, I love books. I get new books all the time. I live in a library with about 55,000 books in it. And sometimes people ask me, what's your favorite book? Years ago, when I built a company, my friends and I built a company called Bookstop. It was really the first chain of book superstores. Later, it was sold to Barnes & Noble, and they made it even bigger and renamed them Barnes & Nobles. Anyway, the, uh, I, I convinced, I begged, and I got my advertising team to let me put in, in like a Christmas catalog list of my favorite books. And uh, I'm sure I had to work hard to convince them. And when I looked at it, I picked as my favorite book, a book called The World Almanac. It's an annual book. Here's the new edition. $12.99. Now, I know I upset a lot of the people I worked with because they said, well, we'd like to see, oh, shouldn't it be Moby Dick or maybe the Bible or something. A lot of fine books out there. I love books. But when I looked at it, I've spent more of my life looking at the World Almanac than any other book. And especially given its low price, it's just incredible value. And I think it makes me a better entrepreneur. It helps me really understand the world in a really powerful way. This is a great book. I bought my first World Almanac in 1959 when I was eight years old. Ran down to the library to see if I could find it. I couldn't find it. I know it's fallen apart because I like read it to death. Here was my fourth one I got in 1962. It's actually in pretty good shape. Maybe that year I learned everything or something. Anyway, uh, had, well, a little tattered. Uh, uh, and then here, because it's a real old book, this is 1892, right before the Chicago World's Fair of 1893 in the Big Depression. So, and it was 25 cents then, seven, uh, help me out, 70 years later, it was $1.35. So it was uh, like, you know, five times as much or so. And now it's just skyrocketed. In only 50 years, it's gone up uh, f uh, almost 10 times in price. $12.99, you can't beat the bargain. So what do I mean when I say I love the World Almanac and it helps me understand the world around me better? So just open it to a random place. When I got this the other day, this new edition, which is readily available, bookstores carry it, um, if you're lucky, newsstands carry it. First thing I just happened to open to was a list of the best-selling U.S. magazines in 2011. Total circulation, both subscribers and newsstand sales. Well, I've been following that list since, you know, 1959. And in the old days, it was like Reader's Digest, National Geographic, I think TV Guide was usually at the top. So it's a reflection of our society and what's going on. And also a reflection of what the magazine industry is pursuing. But So I looked at the list. So what do you think's on top now? Is it the Reader's Digest? Is it National Geographic? Or is they, have they lost their touch? Have they dropped way down? The top two magazines in the United States at 22 million readers each are AARP, the magazine, and the AARP Bulletin. So it's an aging baby boom and senior citizens. Huge numbers, because at 22 million, then number three is only 7 million. The third is big. And of course, they're a little different. AARP is a nonprofit, you know, organization, but nevertheless, so is National Geographic. Then, number three, and this one was in the big leaks way back when, so it stayed there, Better Homes and Gardens. So of the magazines that I grew up with as a kid, Better Homes and Gardens has fared better in terms of ranking than any other magazine, in terms of still being around. Now, here was the one I didn't see coming. Number four, almost six million subscribers or readers, Game Informer magazine. I haven't looked into it, haven't studied it. It's an awesome number. I knew video gaming was big. I didn't know they had their own magazine that was that big. Can you imagine what those ads are worth in that when you're getting to six million people in a niche, a specialized area? Then, real quickly, Reader's Digest and National Geographic. So they're still cranking numbers. Doesn't necessarily mean they're still highly profitable because if you aren't selling as many as you used to, you may build up your overhead. So we'd have to look into that. And I know, uh, I know that Reader's Digest has had some rough financial times. Good Housekeeping, Woman's Day, and Family Circle. Old standbys. Those magazines have been around for ages. In fact, uh, uh, one, um, uh, they were about, uh, two of them were created by supermarket chains as a promotion for their customers. That's in my History of Retailing, which you can find the video online. Uh, and then number 10 is People. And so outside of AARP and the game magazine, that's the only one that I consider a new magazine. I don't know, it's only been around 30 years or something. Um, and then time is hanging in there, although clearly it's gone down in circulation. Ladies Home Journal, A Taste of Home, Sports Illustrated, Cosmopolitan. A lot of the familiar ones, but if you go down the whole list, it's 100 magazines. There are a lot more surprises in there. And, and, and I mean, things like the fact Maxim is now much bigger than Playboy. So even within that segment, men's magazines, whatever they call them, it shifted. Um, 
and, and, and ESPN, the magazine, and oh, Oprah's magazine's in here. The Economist is almost to catch fortune right on its heels. Just reading that and thinking about what it means, the dynamics of that industry, but also the dynamics of the American public. The next page, because I just flipped through the thing loosely, the next page that I came to, it shows how much money of uh, Treasury Department bailout funds we gave out. I won't use a whiteboard and go through it, but I didn't realize we gave $50 billion to General Motors and 10 to Chrysler. So the whole auto industry was 60. And then Bank of America, Citigroup, these are in order of who are the biggest bailouts. Bank of America, Citigroup, JC, JP Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley. So really, the six biggest banking organizations in America together did 160 million. And, and of that 160 million, every penny has been paid back. The automakers, uh, around half of it's been paid back. So out of the 60, like 30 has been paid back. Out of the 160, all of it's been paid back. Over here on the other side, the other big takers, because those guys were big takers out of these, whatever it was, trillion dollars or whatever it is, and the whole TARP thing, whatever it was. Fannie Mae took 104 billion, and Freddie Mac took 65 billion. So between the two of them, they're almost as big as, uh, they're as big as all the banks put together, the big banks. Neither one of them has paid back a penny. So when you hear, and I, I am not, the economics department I studied at the University of Chicago, most of my great teachers are in the grave now, but it's pretty safe to say they will be rolling in their graves. They would not have believed we should have bailed any of those people out. But the thing is, I mean, the banks have kind of shown, well, the money was there. It just took them a while to get it. They really needed interim or short-term financing because they all paid it off, all the big ones. There are a couple of smaller banks that, that haven't paid it back, but only a couple of them. The thing is, um, is the two government created entities that took huge amounts of money, you know, almost as much as the auto industry and the big banks combined, and haven't paid a penny back. Um, they've all paid some dividends, so they have paid some dividends on the, on the debt that they hold or, you know, interest. But, um, you know, I didn't completely realize that. That chart's in here, because this book covers everything. And then the last thing I'd say, what I found interesting, you know, I've been reading the Fortune 500 magazine since I was 12 years old. It was where I first learned about big business. And the Fortune 500 is listed in order of size, biggest company down through number 500. And then they have an index that's by industry, but it's spread over page after page after page. And it's kind of a challenge to get your mind around, because I not only want to look at who's the biggest company, period, but I like to look at them in the, by industry and think, oh, I didn't realize that car maker was three times as big as that one, or that software company was so much bigger than that one. What's well, funny, they, they got the, uh, the okay to put a quick summary of the Fortune 500 in here, just two little pages. But what it is, is it's packed onto those two pages, ranked by industry. So it doesn't really compete with the Fortune 500, who's the biggest, you know, you could figure that out. But that's not, actually they have a second table that is the 100 biggest, not the whole 500 in or size order. But that I can get in the other magazine. Here, this is so cool because I can quickly look down, see who are the biggest pharmaceutical companies, who are the biggest computer makers, who are the biggest home equipment makers, who are the biggest healthcare insurers, who are the biggest food and drug store chains, who are the biggest restaurant chains, who are the biggest oil companies, all in order with current data. Their, uh, well, in this case, it would be their 2010 uh, revenues. Um, there's a lag time these companies report. So actually, I found this in a lot of ways as cool or cooler than any table in the original Fortune 500 magazine. Um, flipping through here, anything you want to know, I started looking at the, the top TV shows. What TV shows have been watched the most? What's the top series every year? And you realize network TV peaked in the 60s or 70s. By the mid-80s, it was still going strong. And with Cosby, it was amazing. But uh, after that, it's really gone downhill in terms of the share of people. And they have a table that shows how cable is gaining market share and old-fashioned, the big four networks are losing share. But it's been going on like over 20 years now, and it just continues and continues. There's no change. It also shows a lot of people don't realize that over a 20-year period, the decline of coffee consumption in America, while soft drinks went way up, and of course bottled water's up. Uh, how much pork do we eat? And what is it? It's, uh, help me, help me, uh, a thousand pages of just information, both text and numbers. I can't think of any book that gives me more joy. I know I'm weird, but maybe you should be a little weirder too. Well, 
That's it for the World Almanac. Run out and get one of these. I believe there's at least one other almanac. I think Time Magazine puts one out. It's not bad either. This is the old standby. We should support it. We should keep it in print. Looking at tables online is not the same as sitting there or reading in a bed or on a plane and just flipping through. And here you can flip back and forth and you can go all the way from television to magazines to what crops to what countries. I didn't realize Zimbabwe and um, the one next door. Uh, um, they're like three times the per capita income. I thought they were both poor. Well, one's really, really poor, and the other one is one third, I mean, three times as poor as that one, or whatever you want to say. And why, though? Because it talked about, you know, the one leader, and this is a dirt poor country. He, he burned all the, the, the shanty towns because he said this is uh, uh, awful that these people live like this. So now there's 700,000 homeless people. Swell guy, huh? Where can you get this information outside of a big, expensive almanac? Uh, encyclopedia, or like reading every page of Wikipedia. I guess I've gone on enough. It's Gary Hoover. I'll see you next time.